Jansen decides to sit it out, Blake Trinan, to me, is the obvious choice to step it in and to perform. Now, we know last year Trinan's numbers were way down in Oakland. In fact, he was replaced as the closer. We know in 2019 he was the man. So I'm not sure which Blake Trinan we would get. I tell you a move that makes a lot of sense to me in L.A. If not Blake Trinan, who I think is probably the the on-the-surface kind of pick. But how about someone like Julio Urias or Dustin May in a short season? Because the Dodgers are so pitching rich so many starters. Ross Stripling could start for any team in the major leagues, probably, but L.A. He's going to be a long guy. Dustin May, if he's on the roster, will be a long guy. Urias, they've said he's the fourth starter. But a Urias or a Dustin May, potentially for this year, now I don't mean beyond this year, but just this year, could be a closer in waiting should Kenley Jansen opt out. And I, I, I really will not be surprised if Jansen does that. The health issue has been the one thing that has, to me, been pushed under the rug. We've we spent so much time prior to now talking about how many games are going to play? The players proposing this and the owners rejecting that and the owners proposing this and the players rejecting that and now the commissioner obviously has stepped in and sometime this week we're going to get that schedule which we're going to talk about in just a moment and the implications of that on fantasy. But with all of that, there was not as much discussion about the health of individual players Now that's starting. Now that we have a schedule, which is something I beg for, put a schedule out there. Then let's deal with the other issues. Now we're dealing with injuries. We're dealing with health concerns. We're dealing with players who say it's not good for me or my family. And I think Kenley Jansen could well be next in line. So if he does say that next week, we're going to go back and replay segments of the July 2nd show that I'm doing right now, and I'm going to say, see, I told you so. And there could be others yet to come. This morning, Lenny spoke about the situation in St. Louis. Hicks having diabetes. Who's going to close? Carlos Martinez wanting to start. Andrew Miller. I don't know that there are any bullets left in that gun. From what I saw last year, he was not the Andrew Miller that we've come to know, love, and fear. (laughs) St. Louis will have a closer. Will it be a closer by committee? Will it be an individual player? I have no idea. But there's opportunity there for someone to step up. So let's talk about scheduling for a few moments. We know that the plan is we're going to play 10 games, 40 games in division. We're going to play 20 games out of division. And everything I'm reading, there's going to be this natural rivalry interleague where instead of playing three or four games, you're going to play six games against a tenth of your schedule against that other team. Yankees-Mets, sure. I'm not going on the Yankees-Mets this morning. I've already done that a previous show. I want to talk about teams that could really benefit from this schedule. Okay, first of all, I think it definitely benefits the West Coast teams and the East Coast teams because they don't travel coast to coast this year. As a Yankee fan, I dreaded West Coast trips. I don't care how bad the Mariners might be. When you got to travel three hours, change time zones, your body just you know, is kind of wonky, right? And so, none of that. So I think the East Coast teams and West Coast teams both benefit 
from not having to change time zones and the three-hour differences. But in, when you look at these schedules, a team that I'm not really high on until I start looking deeper into it is a team Lenny talked about this morning, the St. Louis Cardinals. You say, why is that? Okay, because while everyone in the National League Central is playing each other and they're all playing American League Central teams, in a 60-game schedule, one or two games make a huge difference. It's that you know, you could have teams who finish 33 and 27 and then a team at 32 and 28. Look who in all likelihood the Cardinals will be paired up with for six games interleague rivalry Kansas City Royals. Six games against the Royals. Meanwhile, the Cubs will probably play six games against the White Sox, and we know the White Sox are a strong unit. Look, the Reds, they're going to play probably six games against the Cleveland Indians. Now, I personally think the Cubs and the Reds are a little bit better than the Cardinals, but those six games could determine... <laughs> The division champion. Let's say St. Louis goes 5-1 and one against Kansas City. Meanwhile, the Cubs and Reds break even against Cleveland or the White Sox or finish under 500 against those two teams. That could be the difference in 2020 in making the playoffs and not. Is it fair? I don't think so. I think in 2020, we should have had close to equal games against everybody. Because remember, you'll have a National League East winner. You'll have a National League Central winner. You'll have a National League West winner. And you'll have two wildcard teams. So if you make the assumption the Dodgers, the Braves, the Nationals, maybe the Mets, maybe the Padres. How many teams out of the Central will actually make the playoffs? Now, it could be three. Sure. It could be three teams. And I haven't talked about the Brewers yet. Who do they put the Brewers against? Minnesota? Another steep challenge. Who plays Detroit? I mean, do the Pirates even have a rival? But if Pirates play Detroit, you take that out of the equation for six games. Those other matchups, if they were to match up that way, definitely favors the Cardinals. And if we're in a division where 500 is the norm, don't you think that favors the Cardinals just a little bit? And we're going to see, I hope, Dylan Carlson this year in St. Louis. I think what hurts the Cardinals is the bullpen, potentially. But then again, do the Cubs really have a great bullpen? Do the Reds? We'll see, right? We'll see. I like Cincinnati starting pitching. I think the fact they're playing possibly Cleveland and six games hurts the Reds. We, because, look, Cleveland has great starting pitching. It's going to be an interesting thing to watch, no doubt about it. And I'm just giving you a perspective this morning to think about. And when you look at the other divisions, the Yankees playing the Mets six games, tough games. They hate each other. You've got in the National League, Toronto playing Philadelphia, probably. The one that's interesting to me will be the Tampa Bay Rays against Miami. 
Does that benefit Tampa? Atlanta will probably play Boston. Both had Braves teams. Atlanta has the Braves now. Boston used to have a Braves team. I just think, and Washington, (laughs) they're the big winners, right? Because the Nationals are going to play the Orioles six times. Now, I know the Yankees and Rays and Blue Jays, Boston, they're going to play the Orioles ten times, okay? But I'm talking about the impact on the National League East. While the Mets are pounding out with the Yankees, while the Phillies are playing the Blue Jays, who I think are vastly improved, terribly underrated, Lourdes Gurriel add to the mix of rookies, The pitching is a lot better. Washington gets six games against the Orioles. Not three. And I think they could sweep the Orioles. And again, in a season where there's a difference in 33 and 27 and 32 and 28 and 31 and 29 and 31 and 29 doesn't get in, The Nationals are truly benefited from the schedule. If it were 162 games, ha, so what? But it's not. This is not our generation. This is a new generation of games. This is a new way of looking at it. I got to get out of here. It's great to be with you. Everyone have a great day, and thanks for the happy birthdays. I'll talk to you on Monday on Arnie's Fantasy World of Sports.